All right, I want to start going through chapter three and get some of the core concepts down. I should be able to do this in one video. Um, and we're going to be taking the quiz on Monday. So try to make sure you finish up chapter three. And I'm going to walk uh, through it um, as best I can right now to give you some of the core concepts. Now, chapter two was about grammatical form, what something is. And that gets to the parts of speech. And um, I want to emphasize that is just what something is on its own. It's not useful. You can't do anything with it just by being able to identify what a part of speech is. It doesn't help you at all when you're writing. Um, unfortunately, that's what most people remember when they've had grammar classes in high school. They, it doesn't help them at all. Um, now, what chapter three is going to do is get into function, what something actually does. Um, what something is, is a different matter than what something does. Um, how it actually operates in a sentence and how it functions. Now, you can have something such as a baseball bat, and that's what it is, but you don't necessarily need to use it to hit baseballs. You could, you know, keep it by the side of your bed like a lot of people do to protect yourself in case you have a burglar, okay? Or you can use it to hammer nails. That function or those functions are radically different from what it is, but you could also use it to hit baseballs or softballs or something else. So it's very important that form and function can overlap to a degree, but they are not, you know, determinate. They don't determine absolutely what something is going to do, um, but they usually put some kind of control on what it can do. And you have to be aware when you're in one form, talking about nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, pronouns, um, conjunctions, or when you're in function and you're talking about subjects and verbs, um, complements and objects, adjectives and adverbs, and things like that. And you can notice from the list of things that are in form and the things that are in function, they can overlap, but you're talking about them in slightly different ways. Okay, so let me go through this for a bit. Um, and I'll walk through it and then I'll go to the book. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how about I get rid of myself? There we go. Um, clauses. These are very important to keep in mind. Now, a lot of people confuse the notion of a clause with the notion of a sentence. And I'm going to come back to a sentence in a bit. With clauses, I want to be clear. It's about subjects and verbs working together as a single unit. Okay. Now, we've already covered um, in chapters one and somewhat in chapter two, we covered words and especially phrases I started to get into in chapter two how a whole phrase can function as a noun or as an um, adjective. You can have a prepositional phrase function as an adjective, okay? Or a prepositional phrase function as an adverb, okay? Um, the whole phrase will do that, <clears throat> um, not just words. So the parts of speech, um, nouns and verbs, adjectives and adverbs, prepositions and conjunctions, you're not just talking about words alone. Whole phrases can function as a noun. Okay, The blue house doesn't function really in your mind as two separate things. It's a single item. Okay, You don't have blue and then have house. They actually meld together and become one thing. Um, the fast car, um, you know, if I said the coughing monkey, something really odd, that's actually an adjective. It's called a gerundive um, with a noun. You think of the coughing monkey as a single item. That phrase is a single item. Okay, so this coughing monkey stole the banana. So you think about that coughing monkey stealing bananas. Um, that's when it becomes a clause. Okay, now it's doing something. And what I'm going to tell you is probably different than what you learned before. That subject and verb relationship in your mind functions as a single unit. <clears throat> okay. Um, why I think that, and, I, and I, I know a lot of folks don't view grammar the same way, and that's okay. Um, and again, remember, grammar is always a way of organizing the way we approach language. Different people can organize it different ways. It's like organizing a room. You can organize it in different approaches as long as it's organized. The way I see them is that they're single units in your brain. That's how you think of them. Um, and we, I, I would say we kind of know that because we almost always have subjects and verbs in agreement. I have not seen a significant issue in students who are learning how to write, especially at the English 101 level, in getting their subjects and verbs to agree with each other. That's not happening because people think of them 
together. When I talk about, you know, Susie, um, and Susie is, you know, doing an activity like running, Susie runs. People make them agree almost automatically. They don't even have to think about it. It just comes together automatically. And what that creates is a clause. <clears throat> it does not necessarily create a sentence. And I'm going to come back to that. It creates a subject and verb unit. And that unit is a clause. Okay? So remember, words are a collection of letters that function as a unit. Phrases are collections of words that function as a unit. Okay? Um, you know, to the game, with my friends, you know, under the mountain, these all function together as single units. Okay? Cooking an egg, that's a, a single unit. That's a gerund phrase. Okay? Um, to hit the ball, that's an infinitive phrase. Those things function as single units. Clauses do the same thing. But instead of just being a collection of words, they're a collection of a subject and a verb, or a unity of a subject and a verb. Sometimes with what's called a complement, though. <clears throat> you have two types of clauses. All clauses ever used in the English language are either action clauses or linking clauses. Okay, all of them. It's very important to um, keep this straight because most of you were told that verbs are actions. But as I went through in the last chapter, that's not necessarily so at all. Um, um, linking verbs are not actions. Okay? If I said Susie felt um, you know, sick, she didn't go out and touch the sick. She's not doing anything. That's a linking verb. I'm describing Susie as sick. Susie is sick. Susie felt sick. Susie became sick. Susie seemed sick. Notice in all of these, she's not doing anything. It, those aren't action verbs. So the linking verb list, um, which is very important to review, you don't have to memorize it. Um, it's very important to know it sets up at core a very different type of clause. It sets up that A equals B relationship. So in an action clause, you have a subject which is going to perform an action. That's what it's going to do. And you have a verb, and that verb is the action performed by the subject. You have to realize these really do define each other. They do. The subject defines the verb, and the verb defines the subject. You can often think about it like a husband and wife. You can't really be a wife without a husband, and you can't be a husband without a wife. That's how subjects and verbs work together. They define each other. Now, in action clauses, you can have an object. You don't necessarily need to have one. I'm not going to go into them in this book. Um, I've reduced I have a little bit on transitive verbs and intransitive verbs, um, but honestly, don't worry about it too much. Um, why I, I de-emphasize that is because I have not seen students run into trouble um, because of objects, <clears throat> nor do they improve their writing because they now understand direct and indirect objects and how they work. So don't worry about that. They can be there or they, they don't have to be there. Sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. Um, so just know with action clauses, the subject is who or what performs the action, and the verb is the action performed by the subject. They feed on each other, okay? Um, and something is done. Um, do not use the old definitions you were told. They are wrong. Um, it's not a maybe. In many cases, it's a different view. This is not a different view. The old definition that you heard of a subject of a sentence, that it's who or what the sentence is about, that is wrong. <clears throat> okay? It simply is. And with verbs, just saying look for the action word is very confusing because ing words like cooking an egg, um, they're often not the action, they're not the verb. If I say cooking an egg takes 20 minutes, cooking is not an action. It's an activity. It's actually a gerund. It's a noun. Um, so look for the subject to create the verb and the verb to create the subject. Um, that's what they do. Okay. Subjects um, define verbs and verbs define subject. They work together as a single unit. And when you speak them, they should click and make sense together. In the same way a prepositional phrase clicks. If I say with my friends, that makes sense. Or a gerund phrase, you know, throwing a ball, that makes sense. Or an infinitive phrase, um, to take a break, that makes sense together as a unit. Look for a subject and verb to always make sense together. Okay, to always make sense together.
um, and then you probably have them. That's where you've got to actually use that thing that built-in shockproof shit detector that I've talked about. Um, it should click in your brain. Your brain puts the clause together the same way it puts the phrases together. And the same way it makes sense of words is collections of letters. It doesn't pay attention to the letters, it pays attention to it as a unit. Okay, so an action clause deals with a subject performing an action. Linking clauses are clauses. Um, they are subjects, they are not performing actions though. They are who or what is described through the verb. So the verb is going to be the link. <clears throat> and notice the subject doesn't do anything. The subject gets described by the complement. The verb in the end is just the link between it. Linking verbs have almost no meaning. They really don't. They in the end just hook a subject up with a complement. That's what they do. Some people would say they're essentially conjunctions. Um, I don't think they're entirely wrong. I still put them in, cl in the classification as a verb because they create clauses. But linking verbs really are verbs that function a lot like conjunctions because they put a subject, you know, a dog, um, uh, seems, um, you know, hungry. It puts dog plus hungry. That's what it does. It puts those two things together in your mind. Um, the dog seems hungry. He's not going around seeming or doing anything. He just appears that way. Okay, so that's what linking clauses do. Now that is a little more complicated than a lot of you were told back in junior high and high school. Um, but what you were told in junior high and high school was wrong. Um, there are two types of verbs. One is action, the other is linking. And linking clauses um, are created with linking verbs action clauses with action verbs, okay? And I'll come back to that. I'll show you some examples um, here. Let's go through this. Three types of clauses. Now these are the types of clauses. You will have action and linking independent clauses, action and linking dependent clauses, action and linking relative clauses. Um, we won't go too much into relative clauses. Um, I <clears throat> Only because I find that students can write well without them, I'll show them to you. But I'm not going to worry too much about them. Um, independent clauses, here's what they are. They're a subject and verb. They can be as short as two words long. And the big thing is they can stand alone. That's what they do. And you make sense out of them in your mind. If I put this subject and verb together, can it stand alone? And now a quick um, item here. This is an action clause. Susie punched Marco. Susie is the subject, punched is the verb. Now, in this one, I used an object. Marco got hit. That's all you need for an independent clause. Now, this is an important concept I'm going to come back to. The independent clause could be a sentence. Okay? It could be, but it's not necessarily one. We'll come back to that. Okay? So, an independent clause, those are what are used in sentences. You must have one of those. Okay? And I'm going to come back to that. A dependent clause cannot be a sentence. It's got a subject and verb, though. And this comes back to a problem a lot of students come in with. They think if it has a subject and verb, it must be a sentence. Not at all. If you have a dependent clause, you have a subject and verb because all clauses have subjects and verbs. All of them do. All of them do. Okay? But they have something extra. Now, many of your English teachers will look at a dependent clause and tell you that something's missing. That is wrong. Okay? Dependent clauses have something extra. It's not that something is missing. It has something extra, and that's a subordinating conjunction. We're going to come back to those. I introduced them in Chapter 2. We're going to come back to them in Chapter 4 a lot. But subordinating conjunctions are words like when, if, since, before, until, um, while, whenever, those kind of words. Those are conjunctions. When you put them in front of independent clauses, bingo, you have a dependent clause. That extra word creates the dependent clause. Okay? They cannot stand alone. Okay? And here it is. Here's Susie punching Marco again. Poor Marco. Okay? I think Susie has a crush on him. That's the same exact clause. But right when I add the word when, I think most of you can see it can't stand alone. Now, oftentimes what your teacher will tell you is that it needs something. 
Well, if you take the word when off, Susie punched Marco could work as a sentence. It's grammatically correct. You can add an independent clause to it if you want to, but you don't necessarily need to. So dependent clauses have subjects and verbs, and then they have something extra, a subordinating conjunction. Okay, They're not missing anything. Because they have something extra, they can't stand alone. That's when they, if they're going to be part of a sentence, they need to be hooked onto an independent clause. But they can have that extra thing taken off, and then they're okay. Okay. So relative clauses, uh, really quickly, they have a subject and verb. Um, they do. Um, they have a relative pronoun at the beginning. A who, that, which. Um, if I, you know, but they can't stand alone. A relative clause can't. They kind of look like questions, but they're not really. Um, if I said who ran away, um, that is, that can be configured as a question, but uh, I, I'm not going to teach about questions in this grammar book because you guys don't need to know how to use them. If I said Marco who ran away jumped over the fence, who ran away is a clause. Who is the subject? Ran is the verb. Um, that can't stand alone. It needs to be put next to a noun and then refer to that noun. Okay, so I'm not going to cover them much. They're really neat. Um, they are useful, I think, in higher level writing. Um, but honestly, I've seen a lot of A, B students write without them. I think you should know how to use them, but I'm not going to emphasize them. I'm going to focus on what I've seen in the A, B writers. And they do know how to use independent clauses and dependent clauses. They also know how to use prepositional phrases. And we'll come back to that in a bit. Okay. So they know how to use independent clauses and dependent clauses, and they know how to add um, prepositional phrases. So let me come to this next thing here. The definition of a sentence, and let me really emphasize this. The definitions of a sentence as a complete thought, that is a worthless definition. Okay, Absolutely worthless. Okay, Other definitions that I've seen um, are actually pages long. The full definition um, in that comprehensive grammar of the English language is two pages long. That isn't something you can use. It's accurate, but you can't use it. I'm going to give you a definition um, that's not always accurate, but it's good enough. It'll do the trick. And that definition is that it's an independent clause. That's a grammatical requirement in standard written English. It's not a grammatical re requirement in all dialects. It isn't. In spoken dialects, you can have sentences without an independent clause, okay? <clears throat> if I say, you know, if I ask you, why did Marco run away? Um, and you answered me, because Susie hit him. Um, because Susie hit him is not an independent clause. That's a perfectly good sentence in speech. It is not a good sentence in uh, standard written English, which is what we're covering here, okay? Um, <clears throat> So to be a sentence in standard written English, you must have an independent clause. That is a grammatical requirement. The other part of the sentence, of the definition, and this is very important to keep in mind, is that you say it is a sentence. You say it. You say, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. That works. Um, that gives the people the insight that I want them to have, the information they need. It, you know, it, it works. That's a stylistic decision. In other words, I would make different decisions than you would. You would make different decisions than Susie would. And everybody's going to make different decisions in style. Um, as long as we all have independent clauses in our sentences, um, we can construct the style any darn way we have. Believe it or not, good writers, most of the decisions they make about grammar are not grammatical requirements. They are stylistic decisions. They use grammar to create the style. And that style is not about being fancy. It's about being accurate and precise. That's what it's about. Those are stylistic decisions. Okay, So stylistic decisions to improve the quality of your writing, the accuracy and the value of it. Those are stylistic decisions and person to person will vary. In general, what you want is an independent clause with a lot of other stuff built around it and build other stuff around it for the reason of being precise and accurate and being sophisticated, understanding the situations, the problems, the solutions, the nuances of it. That's what college educated people can do. 
they can use, oops, let me undo that, they can use grammar to be more precise, accurate, and effective. That's what they do, okay? Here's a few examples, then I'll go to the book. Marco ran, that is a sentence in standard written English. It's got a subject and verb and it can stand alone, okay? That is grammatically an acceptable sentence, right? This is not, because Susie had a crush, um, that cannot be a sentence. That's a dependent clause, okay? So it's very important to recognize it's not a matter of the length of the sentence. This is longer. I could keep developing and say because uh, Susie had a crush on Marco from accounting um, for many years. That's still not a sentence. It still isn't. It's still does because it doesn't have a dependent clause. The because word is wrecking it. It has something extra. It's not missing anything. It has something extra. If I take it out of there, Susie had a crush on Marco from accounting. Um, that's now a sentence. Okay, so that's very important to know. Once you have the independent clause, you are grammatically covered. Every other decision you make about your sentence is a stylistic uh, decision. Everything. After you have an independent clause, it's all about style. That is incredibly important to know because you can do a lot of different things. I took the same sentence, Marco ran. That's the independent clause. All, I go, all I'm going to do here is just add prepositional phrases. Marco is the subject, ran is the verb. And all I'm going to do is add prepositional phrases in one adverb from the accounting agency. That's a prepositional phrase, down the hallway. Okay. And I could say on Friday, um, January the 1st, or on Friday on uh, you know, January the 12th, uh, Marco from a, the accounting agency in Barstow ran quickly down the hallway um, and out the door to his car. All I've done is make a stylistic decision to add a lot of prepositional phrases. That's all I just added. The only thing that's not a preposition is the word quickly. That's an adverb. On Friday, January 20th, Marco from the accounting agency in Barstow ran quickly down the hallway and out of the doors to his car. All of those details give that sentence a lot more vividness. And notice I'm not just fluffing it up. That give it a lot more vividness and action and dyna uh, dynamism that Marco Rand doesn't have. I don't think it does. You might just like Marco Rand. Okay, but you don't want to write a lot of sentences that are that short. You're going to be very choppy. Um, notice that that one stylistic decision to add prepositional phrases changes the nature of the sentence dramatically. Um, that's what I'd call a bit of a grammatical hack. Um, prepositional phrases are the one element that you can use to flesh out your writing very well. It was, in my review of previous students who have gotten A's and B's, it was the one grammatical or one stylistic decision they made far more often than the students who were getting C's and D's. And they did it because it allowed them to add more detail and precision to their writing. Just adding prepositional phrases alone will dramatically improve the quality of your writing. And it's entirely stylistic. Prepositional phrases are not necessary, but boy do they help out enormously creating a more precise and accurate writing style. Okay. Susie had a crush on Marco. Notice I got rid of the uh, dependent, excuse me, the um, subordinating conjunction. Now it can be a sentence. Susie had a crush. That's a subject, a verb, and that's an object. That's what it is. Okay. On Marco, from accounting, I added two more prepositional phrases. And I can add prepositional phrases all day long. Okay. So know that. Now let me go into this really fast. I won't finish it up, but I'll get us started. Look at the dog. Um, let me go into the function of words and just get you started on this one. Um, I'll finish it up in the next video. These are the terms you need to know for um, function. Subjects, full verbs, that's going to be the helping verb plus an action verb, or a helping verb plus a linking verb. Okay. They just help out action or they help out uh, linking verbs. Um, objects, don't worry too much about them, but they happen with um, action verbs. Complements happen with linking verbs. Adjectives and adverbs can be um, littered throughout clauses. They're optional, and they can littered, uh, be littered throughout, okay? Um, and they can be whole phrases. Always keep that in mind. So there's action clauses, and there's linking clauses. We covered that. Um, 
So I covered the misconceptions. And this is one exercise I want to show you guys um, just so it's easy. Um, label the clauses in the following sentences, um, statements. And all I'm saying is, tell me if you think it's a clause. If you don't think it is, say, you know, just don't put anything. Jeremy could not find his socks. That's a clause. Okay. Under the bed, beside the sleeping cat, and empty Del Taco bags. That's actually not a clause. That's actually one big, long prepositional phrase. We are late. Yeah, that's got a subject and verb. That's a clause. And I'm just asking you to kind of check your, um, your sense. This is your shit detector. Whether or not you can pick up clauses, if there's a subject and verb. Kendrick can lift. That's um, Kendrick Ferris. Um, he can lift. Um, he was a U.S. Olympic athlete. Um, that's subject and verb. Yeah, and uh, that works well. Helping verb, action verb. Setting the U.S. record for the clean and jerk in his weight class. That's not a clause. That's one big um, uh, gerund phrase. Columbus's journey to the new world. Most people can see that's not one either. So just do the rest of these. See if you think it has a subject and verb, and you're good to go. Okay. Now, um, two types of um, clauses, two types of subjects, to, um, two types of verbs, two types of subjects, two types of clauses. The verb really determines what type of um, clause it is. Um, so the main verb is an action when it's performed by a subject, and the main verb is a linking verb when it, is, when it connects a subject to a description of the, um, um, of the subject. Okay, so it's an A equals B situation. So these are the two, and the verb determines it. The main verb, that's the last verb in the line of the verb phrase, will determine whether or not it's an action verb or if it's a linking verb. It can't be somewhere in between. It's like going to bat in baseball. You've got to pick the left side or the right side of the plate. You can't stand in the middle. <clears throat> okay. So there's action clauses where people do things. And notice the subject performs the action and the action is performed by the subject. The object is optional. Okay. And with linking clauses, the subject is described by the complement and the complement describes the subject. The linking verb just sticks them together. They don't have much meaning. <clears throat> okay. Full verb is the helping verb plus the action verb or the helping verb um, plus the linking verb. That's what the full verb is. Okay, it, it is essentially a verb phrase. So in here what I've done is I've highlighted, um, put in bold the subject, and then I want you to try to find the verb. <clears throat> the design for the backyard would not include a number of drought resistant plants. Okay, um, The design would not include. That's really the subject and verb. It's really would include. The design, if you, but if you say the verb is would not include, I'm going to give it to you. Um, the sprinkler system should have included. Notice that makes sense. The three gardeners would not have agreed. It's really would have agreed. The not is your little brother jumping in the middle. That's an adverb, but who cares? If you get that subject with this verb, you're good to go. <clears throat> okay. Um, so all I want you to do is get the um, full verb as you think it is. Um, war gathering is the next one. Um, not always, but if you underline always, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't care. That's, that's, this is an adverb. This is an adverb. Um, this is an adverb. It's just jumping in the middle. That's what adverbs can do. Okay. And you're going to see that they function together as single units and operate together in your mind. And then I want you to write out the subject and verb. And really, once you get done with exercise 3.3, you will understand subjects and verbs as single units. You need to put on uh, turn on your shit detector, and if this subject over here makes sense with the verb you put over here, and you're taking them from this exercise, take them from this exercise, take that subject, I've given it to you, take this verb and put it down there, and if those click, you've got it. So this ex these two exercises uh, interact with each other. They could take a little bit longer, but they make all the difference in the world. Okay, and that's all I got for you now. I'll finish up the book on the next video, um, but be ready for the um, um, for the quiz on Monday. Take care.